great to have everyone here on a rainy Thursday morning. You guys are great to be here. Um, and I'm joined by Rajan Ruparel, yep. um, who is uh, both an, an entrepreneur as well as an investor. So this is weird about, I'm giving your bio while you're sitting right there, but I'm just going to go for it. Um, so you started RJR Group. Yep. Uh, so you invest not just here in North America, but also Europe. Also a co-founder of Groupon International by way of City Deal, helped uh, Groupon IPO in 2011. So why don't we start by how you got City Deal off the ground? Okay, that's very cool. I'm um, happy to do that, but based on your intro, you seem far more interesting than I am, so <laughs> maybe we should reverse it at some point. But um, yeah, so I'll tell you guys a, a quick story just to give you some background on, on City Deal. Um, so you know, I'm a, I consider myself a serial entrepreneur, which means I've failed hundreds and hundreds of times uh, building a bunch of businesses. Um, and then we got really lucky uh, to find a model and, and a team that made sense. Um, in 2010, uh, we started a company called City Deal, which... I like to say that we started Groupon, but we just copied the hell out of it um, in, in 2010 in Europe. Um, we saw the model of Groupon uh, working in the United States, um, and we were looking for our next business model um, that we could uh, grow at a, at a crazy pace. And we stumbled upon this, across this model, um, and we were able to raised a lot of money early and we started this company called City Deal. Um, and we started in January of 2010 um, and we grew a very, very fast uh, from about three to 500 employees in about six months, uh, which, is, um, which was a bit insane at the time. Uh, but we didn't realize it at the time. You know, and you're, you're in that mode where you're just building a startup as fast as possible. Um, and you kind of reflect back on it and see how crazy that was. Um, and we grew. And you're 26 at the time. Meanwhile, yeah, 26. No clue what you're doing, but think you know what you're doing. And um, we grew it from the three to 500 employees, one to 18 countries, and we were about six months old. Um, and we thought this was normal um, because you know that's all you knew, and you're young enough to. Uh, to, to be naive. And so we actually got an offer um, about six months into our growth curve uh, from Groupon, which again, we thought was normal. We're like, business is easy. This is really cool. You build a company really fast and you sell it. Um, That's and, the code of the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, little do I know, I guess seven years later, you realize nothing usually works out that way. Uh, but uh, Groupon came to the table. We were the fastest growing competitor to them. In fact, we were growing. We were, Groupon was only 400 employees. We were, uh, by the time they bought us, I think we were 800 employees. Mm -hmm. So we were double the size of them uh, in headcount. Uh, and they were looking at building an international footprint. And the timing was very different from, from what it is now. Back then, access to international markets were a lot harder. The spread of information was um, slower. And so Groupon was looking to access international. And you know, we weren't really interested. Um, and they, they came to us and we said, make us an offer. Uh, and they made us an offer and we happily took it. Um, and I guess we uh, we'd kind of told them, kind of, this is where we want to be at. Um, and they pretty much wrote us a check for that much. So mm. kind of makes me the stupidest man on earth. And I should have uh, doubled that offer. But <laughs> hindsight, at 26 years old, someone offers you nine figures for a company, you, you take it right, uh, right. and run. And so um, that's kind of the story of how we built. Cool. And Good then, story. Yeah. And I stayed on for part of that deal was to stay on for uh, three and a half or four more years with Groupon. Um, and, you know, at, at the time, that sounded like a horrible, horrible thing for an entrepreneur to have to stay on with the company and, and be corporate. Uh, but it was an amazing experience. I ended up getting to do some of the cooler entrepreneurial things that I've done in my career. Uh, we, we ended up growing Groupon from now 18 countries. We were responsible for all their international growth. Uh, so took it from 18 to 46 countries at the time. Um, and then we moved ahead um, of the IPO to the US and took over the entire US business as well. We were growing a lot faster than the American business, mm -hmm. um, our city deal business that we'd kept separate. Um, and so we ended up growing the US business. And then I got to start something called Groupon Goods, which still is probably one of my favorite parts of our Groupon story, which was um, the product side of Groupon. Um, and that was turned into a couple billion dollar business in itself. And so I got to be entrepreneurial within a company that gave you all the resources. So you weren't struggling to decide which computer to buy or who to hire. You could do what you want and grow as fast as you possibly could uh, without a resource problem. Um, and then I left end of as soon as the four years were over, I, I, my itch was already uh, brewing, and so I left um, at the end of four years uh, my, my corporate gig at Groupon. So. Well, so one of the things I wanted us to focus on uh, in the next half hour is this 
breakthrough moment. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, as you know well, find themselves at that crossroads. You have to decide, you know, I have a good idea, but do I want to keep going here? Like, do I want to spend the next several years of my life and probably a lot of someone else's money um, running with this if I have that opportunity? Or do I bail out? You've been on both sides of that equation. You've been the entrepreneur. You've been the investor now. Um, so you talk about exploiting your unfair advantage. What do you mean by that? What is this unfair advantage that you're referring to? Yeah, so I think, I think that couples with exactly the other word that you mentioned, which is breakthrough. And I think those go hand in hand. And I, there's a lot talked about and there's a lot written about what an unfair advantage is. Um, and I think a lot of it is very macro. You know, you need to have an unfair advantage to win. Great. You know, what, do, what does that mean? And I think that context changes significantly when you are a startup. It's very easy to look back 10 years from now and say, okay, well, our unfair advantage was X. But at the time and the moment you're in, um, you know, startups are asked or, you know, all these articles or books are written that you need to identify what your unfair advantage is. Um, so when you look back in 10 years, you'll, you'll know why you won. Um, that's one of the most impossible things to be able to do is identify that macro unfair advantage. Um, and so when you're in the thick of that, when you, yeah, when you're in the thick of things, because really from a macro level, there's there's a few major unfair advantages you have when it comes to tech or startup or building a company. One is you have uh, significant financial capital. Uh, second is you have uh, an inordinate amount of human capital that's beyond um, beyond the average or way above the average. Three, you have um, exclusivity, whether it's an algorithm or technology that makes sense, or it's exclusive contracts for you to be able to leapfrog ahead of everyone else. Or four, you have a distribution network that um, is inaccessible. So that's also exclusive in itself. Um, and all of those are access, right? At the end of the day, when you think about it, uh, business is built on access. So you have access to capital, you have access to people, you have access to exclusivity because of the partnerships or relationships you have, or you have access to a distribution channel that nobody else has. So those are great. You know, it's great to know those, and it's great to sit down when you're writing your first business plan or not, which I, I don't think is necessary. But when you're, when you're sitting down and saying, okay, what, what my one pager or my half pager on how I'm going to build this business, because it never works out that way, um, it's good to know, okay, where, where out of those macro ones I'm going to have an advantage. And hopefully it's one, two, or three of those, um, especially in this competitive tech startup world. Um, I think five, seven, eight years ago, you could have one of those and really have an impact. Today, you need multiple unfair advantages within that spectrum. Um, and, um, you know, we can talk about how that actually implies in Canada at some point. But um, I think those are the macros. But the micros are really about if you're if you're a startup um, in this world, unless you have some unfair advantage when it's a proprietary algorithm or technology that's so far beyond, and honestly, that's so f far and few between these days when it comes to company, even though people think they have this amazing technology, um, which really ties into to being self-aware. Um, unless you have one of those, every week you're building a company, your company's moving, and it's shifting. And, um, you know, it's, and it, it's not always true with, with, with my companies or the companies I invested. I wish that was the case where every week that the company is in such a different spot. Um, but it's not. Sometimes I look back on four weeks and be like, what the F? Like, why are we still where we were four weeks ago in terms of our, our trajectory? You should be able to almost open that book and it's a whole new chapter. Um, so every week that you have that journey, you need to be asking yourself, not what's my unfair advantage, because that's just a very obscure macro thought that you probably read about on some tech blog at some point. Um, but really, how can, I, how can I be better than all the rest this week in my micro goal? So if your goal is to acquire customers over this two-week period, you need to think to yourself, how can I leapfrog? How can I have a breakthrough? How can I have a significant unfair advantage in that micro goal so you can get to two weeks from now where you'll have another unfair advantage? And you're asking yourself, why would investors want to invest in me? Um, you're asking yourself, uh, who's going to want to partner with me? Um, most importantly, who's going to want, buy, want to buy my product because of it? Um, and then, I guess, actually, more importantly, who's going to want to work for me because I have this unfair advantage? Because there's hundreds and hundreds of tech startups out there, and everyone has their choice. Um, and we all know how important talent is. So, Right. Take me back to young Rajan, 2000, uh, what was it, 2009? 2009? 2010. 2010. 26 years old. You don't want to know about 2009, um, Raj. No. Okay, listen, I'm just going to say at 20... <laughs> 
people in their 20s are not the most self-aware. No. Don't hit me with anything. Um, no. But, you know, seriously, like you're, as you said, they, they, when we're tw in, in our mid-20s, we think we know it all. I mean, we have so much energy. We have uh, a lot of great ideas, but self-awareness, I think comes a little bit later in life, it's fair to say, for most people. Um, how do you figure out what your unfair advantage is? I mean, w were you spending time thinking through this, like kind of this existential question, or did you have people helping you guide, guide your way to that at the time, or was it really something that, you only, that only occurred to you after the fact? Um, after the fact. And I think that's where the opportunity here is for, for those to really think about it. I wish I thought about it a little deeper at the time because it, it you know, we were successful and it's a great story, but usually you're, uh, we also left a lot on the table because we weren't self-aware. And I think um, it's really being self-aware of what you need to get somewhere. And I talked about that micro level. I don't think we were inherently uh, thoughtful of this process. Um, and I don't think you necessarily need to be. It's very, it's very macro in itself. But what you need to do is to think, we, what well, we were thinking all the time. Um, and now I can look back on it and say, okay, that's where that success comes from. It's kind of looking back, like you look back on a president 10 or 20 years later and you're like, okay, they're, they're, that's how you can really judge. I can look back on that time and judge um, what we did right and what we did wrong. But at the time, we did have um, a bit of awareness in that we knew what we needed to get done to be able to get our breakthroughs. Um, and I think breakthrough is such a critical word because startups are built on kind of that, you know, the 80-20 rule still applies or the 90-10 rule still applies. Is that at the end of the day, businesses built, are built on breakthroughs. And people that have like, you know, I, I see investor decks all the time with like nine revenue streams. And I'm like, oh God, like, kill me now, right? Like, you know, or you see, you know, investor decks that are saying, well, okay, we can approach it six or seven different ways. Um, once you identify your unfair advantage, you've got to make a bet. And once you make a bet, um, you've got to go for a breakthrough. And once you hit that breakthrough, you need to double down or triple down on that breakthrough because you have a finite amount of time. Um, I'll give you an example. So when we were, um, this is kind of a fun story. So when we were at City Deal, um, you know, it's, it's all roses now, but uh, we started January 2010. In March of 2010, um, I got a call from our investors. And we were luckily very highly capitalized. Um, and for a European startup at the time, we were probably one of the more funded European startups. Mm -hmm. uh, we were backed by these um, crazy brothers called the Zamwar brothers, um, who I'm very close with. And at the time, they weren't as infamous as they are now. In fact, I lived with one of the brothers in London um, at the time. And um, we... Uh, we were trying to figure out, okay, how does this model work? Like, truthfully, City Deal was a complete failure for the first two months. You know, we'd, we'd launched it, like everybody, we launched this amazing website, we had it all online, we had the greatest idea in the world, and then you click the button and you're like, oh, f you know, like, nobody's buying anything. Um, and so we realized, um, and by being self-aware, we well, first off was realizing that this sucks, whereas a lot of people take six or nine months or 12 months to realize, okay, we've got a problem. Um, and because we had investors that were, were self-aware and that in the lightest form pushed us, I guess that's probably the most polite way of saying it, um, we realized we had to do something. And so um, the way that we grew in our breakthrough moment um, was we realized that we need to acquire customers for cheap. Um, we needed to do it different from everybody else, right? The whole world has access to Facebook and Google and acquisition of customers. And even in 2010, although the penetration wasn't there that it is today, you know, you're, you're doing it like everybody else. You're going to end up like everybody else. And we were in a highly competitive market at the time. Uh, we had Living Social and a bunch of other, there was 3,000 deal companies in the world at the time, and our goal was to be number one so we could get acquired. And so we ended up um, doing something which uh, seems genius now, but at the time was incredibly risky. And we realized we needed to acquire companies uh, or, or customers very, very cheap. And so we were based in London at the time. We had a good relationship with Odeon, which is kind of like Cineplex in, in Canada. Um, and we ended up buying 100,000 movie tickets uh, for five uh, pounds, uh, five British pounds at the time um, from City Deal. And I actually called my investor. We didn't have, you know, we had access to um, uh, laid capital, which essentially meant that they'd send us 100,000 at a time because they didn't trust these 25 year olds to not go to the bar Meanwhile, and blow it all. I have a pit in my stomach. Where is the story going? Yeah, so <laughs> that's a lot of tickets. Yeah, so I convinced them that they needed to send us half a million bucks because we needed to secure 
a, uh, our lease and they needed to see cash in our bank account. So I had to convince him why he had to send me half a million pounds. So I completely lied to him. Um, and they wired the half a million. I said, I'll wire it back to you guys within 24 hours. But the only way that we can secure this lease in London um, for our building is if we can show that we have capital to pay the lease for five years or something. So they're like, okay, we'll wire you the money. But it's, uh, it was a Monday and we need it back by Friday. Um, so he wires me the money. And at this point, like you think, okay, this, this startup is going to shut down in 30 days. There's nothing to lose, right? Except for these three German brothers trying to kill me. Um, and so we, um, we wired the money in. Um, we uh, bought 100,000 movie tickets for five pounds. Um, and we put a big ad in the Evening Standard, which is the big newspaper there, saying movie tickets for one pound. Um, which doesn't seem very sensical, um, but we sold, uh, obviously, we sold 100,000 movie, t and we said no catches, movie tickets for one pound, um, and we sold 100,000 movie tickets in, I think, seven hours. At that time, we had like 20,000 paying customers, so we've now gone 5x in terms of our paying customers, and I've now acquired them for five pounds each, which sounds now smart, but at the time, it was one of the bigger risks we had. And we, what we needed was paying people on the platform. Um, and it kind of went back, I went back to our sampling idea of when you give out a free sample, you give out a free razor, people use it. The problem with us is we couldn't give free stuff away because we needed people to type in their credit card mm -hmm. and to transact. Um, and so we were able to um, acquire 100,000 customers overnight. Um, and then what we did was we, well, we called it playing our deals. So we played our best local deals, the best spas, the best restaurants, the most, you know, most interesting local attractions um, in the two or three days following um, in each one of those cities. So in London or in Brighton or in Edinburgh or in Liverpool. Um, and we were able to actually pay back. I was actually able to pay uh, our investors back that money by Friday because we were able to acquire the customer, pick up the margin on the deals the following day. Um, and now we had, uh, we went from 20,000 subscribers to 120,000. And then on Monday, we raised another round because we were able to show investors that we just increased 5x. Um, that was a huge breakthrough moment for us. Um, and that came from self-awareness. That came from realizing that we actually weren't as good as we thought we were. Mm -hmm. um, and we needed to really dig in the hole. And speed was everything yeah. at that point. So, You know, a lot of times uh, these talks are either uplifting or like tough love. Let's do tough love for a quick second. <laughs> since You just <laughs> told favorite. that really intense story. Um, a fascinating story, honestly. Um, how do you know if you have the chops to do something like that? Pure self-awareness. I mean, there's two things. You need to know it yourself and ask yourself that deep question. Am I actually, who, who actually am I? What are my skill sets? Um, and, uh, and second of all, you need someone pushing you. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you always, you know, the best entrepreneurs in the world have somebody on top of them, no matter what, telling them or reminding them or calibrating them. Um, that really comes from asking yourself that question. And for those young entrepreneurs in the room, it's one of those questions you really deeply have to ask yourself because it's a significantly competitive environment. The same applies in sports. You know, there's people that chase these dreams for years and years and years, but are they really good enough to make the majors? And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't follow your dreams because I think you can achieve them in so many different ways. There's multiple ways to get there, um, but you got you really got to ask yourself a question. I'll give you I'll give you kind of something personal from my perspective. You know, I'm kind of seen as this you know entrepreneur, and I've had you know multiple wins. But the truth is, is that I'm not the best at starting a company from zero to one. Um, but everybody wants to be that guy, right? Everyone wants to be the one that started it from zero to one. But zero to one is a really, really painful, boring, horrible process. Uh, there's a lot of admin. There's a lot of like grunt work. Um, and there's people that are just exceptional. I've got you know entrepreneurs in my group um, and partners that I work with that are just amazing at this. Um, but everybody wants to be that. Everyone wants to be the next Zuckerberg or the next Bezos. And I'm going to put my hands in and I'm going to be there from day one. And I'm going to be employee number one of my own company. Um, and I'm going to be the one that makes that happen. And then I'm also going to take it to a uh, multi, multi, multi-billion dollar public company. And you think to yourself, okay, where do you really fit into that equation? And where can I have the most impact? Um, the other thing is also knowing at what side of the company are you good at, right? You have sales guys that want to be operation guys because that's really exciting at the time. You get operation guys that want to be sales guys and marketing guys. Um, and so that division of labor of asking yourself where that talent really is, um, that's what slows down companies. Mm -hmm. That really just slows down companies. And I think people are just inherently greedy that they want to try to do it all. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if your mindset is and your goal is to win, um, you know, if you look at it, you win 
you win at all costs. And if you're going to win at all costs, you need to make sure that you've surrounded yourself with great people. And I always go back to sports. I'm a big sports fan. And I say, if you're building a team and you have the defensemen playing up forward, trying to score all the goals, there's no way you're winning a Stanley Cup. Um, and, you know, the defenseman knows that, hey, I'm a defensive defenseman. And so that awareness, and he has a coach telling him, stop playing up. But he's also, if you're a champion player, you also know what you're good at. And so... I think there's so many entrepreneurs out there. You know, everyone and their mother is an entrepreneur now building a tech startup. Um, everybody graduates from MBA school and says, hey, I'm building a tech startup. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I, have, I think that's awesome. Um, but at the same time, know where you fit into that. Um, and, you know, there's, obviously there's, there's more failed tech startups than, than ones that, that make it. In fact, sure. by 8, 9, 10x, right? So there's a reason for that. And um, it all comes down from being self-aware. So Okay, let's ask uh, a question from the social Q&A. Uh, you guys probably know you can ask questions. So here's one. Uh, do you think branding has become an important component of obtaining an unfair advantage more than pure technological differentiation? Do I think branding creates an unfair advantage. No, I, I, I do think at a certain point, but not early stage in a startup. A brand is critical, I mean, at the end of the day. But you can all, only look at that at a certain segment. And it's not about brand. It's really about market penetration, right? Brand leads to market penetration, whether you own the market or not. So you can look deep into a company's history and you say, okay, now they've built an amazing brand. That's a defensible... Uh, it's defensible because it takes capital. It goes back to one of my early, early core points of whether it's capital or team or exclusivity. So they exclusively have a brand, but that brand can still be penetrated, but they've created financial defense in a way because brands are very, very expensive to create. Brands are not created through virality. They're created by um, really, you know, I mean, the truth fact, as much as it's not the soft, warm, fuzzy thing that everyone wants to hear, is that brands are created by money. And at the end of the day, um, you're creating something defensible over a period of time. But early day in a startup, um, for you to be like, well, we're going to be defensible by creating an amazing brand, that's an amazing thought process. And that's very, again, warm and fuzzy. But A, how are you going to do that? B, do you have a team that is so good, like world-class effing good, that the brand is going to supersede all other brands out there? And if you do, why on the investor deck do you put them on page 11? Where everyone takes their team decks and everyone's seen an investor deck, everyone's created an investor deck, and team is always like page 11 on the investor deck or page 15 on the investor deck. And you're just like, if that's your unfair advantage, because brand comes from people, if that's your unfair advantage, that better be the fucking cover. Sorry, I shouldn't say that, but that better be the cover page. <laughs> um, my comms director will kill me at some point, but um, uh, it better be the cover page. Because that's your unfair advantage. But nobody ever puts their team as their cover page. So if you're building a brand, um, you better say that's what we're going to build on and that's what we're going to, at the end of the day, win on. Swearing is kind of tough love, right? <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> we all do it. It's okay. Yeah. Um, you recently moved back to Canada. Um, what is it? How many years ago? Uh, just, about a year. Just about a year about ago. A year yeah. ago. Um, what, what brought you back here? Um... Yeah, a couple things. Uh, unselfish and selfish, to be self-aware and honest. Um, unselfishly, um, I'm, I'm a patriotic Canadian. I've kinda, I, I, was, I was born and raised in Calgary. I went to U of T, but I haven't lived here in a long time. You know, I, I was in London, and then I was in the U.S. Uh, tech world for a while. Um, I, you know, I think it's the greatest country to live in. I'm, I'm super happy to be home. It was about, you know, as I grow up and I want to have a family and um, where we want to be. I think that was one of it. Uh, one of it. Two, two is the ability to have impact on young entrepreneurs here and the ability to actually impact an ecosystem. Um, big fish, medium pond, you have the ability to really have impact on people one-to-one -one, um, and have access, uh, which I think is, uh, has been nice. I think the impact that I could have here um, with the opportunity here, um, both... Um, selfishly and unselfishly is an opportunity. Um, we're quite philanthropically involved, so being able to um, to to invest in the stuff that we really believe in, which is uh, giving back at home as much as we possibly can. Um, and then from a selfish perspective, uh, you know, I'm still early 30s. I'm still you know building businesses and investing in businesses. I think Canada is is, is significantly untapped. Um, the next five years is going to be incredibly amazing. You may not be building $10 billion companies or a 
billion dollar companies overnight, um, but you're building hundred million dollar companies and you have to be understand your scope. Um, and there are opportunities there. Toronto and Canada, nobody really can define it yet um, of where it lies on this tech or investment ecosystem. You know in New York you have significant media startups. You know in Silicon Valley you have, um, you know, true tech and real like, um, real computer tech. Um, Toronto is a mix of everything. Uh, Canada, Vancouver is a mix of everything. Um, I think that's part of the problem because you don't have capital really jumping in because they don't know exactly what they're betting on. Um, and I found that the same was in Chicago as well or some of these Midwest cities. People don't really know what they're betting on, so it's very difficult to get sticky and attached to it. That's going to change. But um, you, you've been here a year now. Is that already changing at all? Because there's a lot of talk, if you're, if you're getting pelted again when I, they ask this question, um, <laughs> is this Canada's tech moment is like the big question everyone is asking, especially given the politics south of the border. Um, so you, I feel like with a year under your belt, you have a pretty good sample size to work with. What do you think? No, not yet. I think um, it's, you know, it's, it's, again, it's nice to say. I think we're still a long way away. Um, I think there's, there's so many cool companies building out, uh, building out of there. But when you talk about tech moment, you're talking about a community building together to really have infrastructure uh, that's developed. You know, I think, um, you know, you t you, we get, you know, all these announcements on government funding, but it's, it's, it's minuscule compared to um, what a lot of the other tech ecosystems have. Uh, and, and finance and human capital, like I talk, these unfair advantages also work here. Um, and we still don't have that. And that's not an insult to Canadians. It's just you need more of it um, and in, in order to compete. The tech world is very globally competitive, right? It's not, um, it's not border, borderless at the end of the day, right? And so we have to really understand that we are competing with companies in the US, we're competing with companies in, in, in Germany, in, in, um, you know, there's some amazing companies in Israel, um, in tech, and I think you have to look at yourself of how can you compete on a global scale. I think we're still small. That's where the opportunity, it will break at some point, um, and that's where I think I'm excited about, uh, but there, we still have a long, long way to go there, so. Rajan, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your time, appreciate your it. Thoughts.